Space Shuttle Columbia. Space Shuttle Columbia, orbiter vehicle designation, OV-102, was the first space-rated orbiter in NASA's Space Shuttle fleet. It launched for the first time on mission STS-1 on April 12, 1981, the first flight of the Space Shuttle program. Over 22 years of service, it completed 27 missions before disintegrating during re-entry near the end of its 28th mission, STS-107 on February 1, 2003, resulting in the deaths of all seven crew members. Construction began on Columbia in 1975 at Rockwell Internationals, formerly North American Aviation-slash-North American Rockwell, Principal Assembly Facility in Palmdale, California, a suburb of Los Angeles. Columbia was named after the American sloop Columbia Rediviva which, from 1787 to 1793, under the command of Captain Robert Gray, explored the U.S. Pacific Northwest and became the first American vessel to circumnavigate the globe. It is also named after the command module of Apollo 11, the first man landing on another celestial body. Columbia was also the female symbol of the United States. After construction, the orbiter arrived at Kennedy Space Center on March 25, 1979, to prepare for its first launch. Columbia was originally scheduled to lift off in late 1979, however the launch date was delayed by problems with both the Space Shuttle main engine, SSME, as well as the Thermal Protection System, TPS. On March 19, 1981, during preparations for a ground test, workers were asphyxiated while working in Columbia's nitrogen-purged aft engine compartment resulting in, variously reported, two or three fatalities. The first flight of Columbia, STS-1, was commanded by John Young, a veteran from the Gemini and Apollo programs who was the ninth person to walk on the moon in 1972, and piloted by Robert Crippen, a rookie astronaut originally selected to fly on the military's manned orbital laboratory, MOL, spacecraft, but transferred to NASA after its cancellation and served as a support crew member for the Skylab and Apollo Soyuz missions. Columbia spent 610 days in the Orbiter Processing Facility, OPF, another 35 days in the Vehicle Assembly Building, VAB, and 105 days on Pad 39A before finally lifting off. Columbia was successfully launched on April 12, 1981, the 20th anniversary of the first human space flight, Vestok 1, and returned on April 14, 1981. After orbiting the Earth 36 times, landing on the dry lake bed runway at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Columbia then undertook three further research missions to test its technical characteristics and performance. Its first operational mission, with a four man crew, was STS 5, which launched on November 11, 1982. At this point, Columbia was joined by Challenger, which flew the next three shuttle missions, while Columbia underwent modifications for the first Space Lab mission. In 1983, Columbia, under the command of John Young on what was his sixth space flight, undertook its second operational mission, STS-9, in which the Space Lab Science Laboratory and a six-person crew was carried, including the first non-American astronaut on a space shuttle, Elf Merbold. After the flight, Columbia spent 18 months at the Rockwell Palmdale facility beginning in January 1984 undergoing modifications that removed the orbiter flight test hardware and bringing it up to similar specifications as those of its sister orbiters. At that time the shuttle fleet was expanded to include Discovery and Atlantis. Columbia returned to space on January 12, 1986, with the launch of STS-61C. The mission's crew included Dr. Franklin Chang Diaz, as well as the first sitting member off the House of Representatives to venture into space, Bill Nelson. The next shuttle mission, STS-51 Leader, was undertaken by Challenger. It was launched on January 28, 1986, 10 days after STS-61C had landed, and ended in disaster 73 seconds after launch. In the aftermath NASA's shuttle timetable was disrupted, and Columbia was not flown again until 1989, on STS-28, after which it resumed normal service as part of the shuttle fleet. STS-93 launched on July 23, 1999, was the first U.S. space mission with a female commander, Lt. Col. Eileen Collins. This mission deployed the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Columbia's final successful mission was STS-109, the fourth servicing mission for the Hubble Space Telescope. Its next mission, STS-107, culminated in the orbiter's loss when it disintegrated during re-entry, killing all seven of its crew.
Consequently, President Bush decided to retire the shuttle orbiter fleet by 2010 in favor of the Constellation program and its manned Orion spacecraft. The Constellation program was later canceled with the NASA Authorization Act of 2010 signed by President Obama on October 11. As the second orbiter to be constructed, and the first able to fly into space, Columbia was roughly heavier than subsequent orbiters such as Endeavour, which were of a slightly different design, and had benefited from advances in materials technology. In part, this was due to heavier wing and fuselage spars, the weight of early test instrumentation that remained fitted to the avionics suite, and an internal airlock that, originally fitted into the other orbiters, was later removed in favor of an external airlock to facilitate shuttle slash mirror and shuttle slash international space station dockings. Due to its weight, Columbia could not have used the planned Centaur G booster, canceled after the loss of Challenger. The retention of the internal airlock allowed NASA to use Columbia for the STS-109 Hubble Space Telescope servicing mission, along with the SpaceHab double module used on STS-107. Due to Columbia's heavier weight, it was less ideal for NASA to use site for missions to the International Space Station, though modifications were made to the shuttle during its last refit in case the spacecraft was needed for such tasks. Externally, Columbia was the first orbiter in the fleet whose surface was mostly covered with high and low temperature reusable surface insulation, HRSI slash LRSI, Tylos is its main thermal protection system, TPS, with white silicone rubber painted Nomex, known as felt reusable surface insulation, FRSI, blankets, in some areas want wings, fuselage and payload bay doors. FRSI once covered almost 25% of the orbiter. The first upgrade resulted in its removal from many areas, and in later flights it was only used on the upper section of the payload bay doors and inboard sections of the upper wing surfaces. The upgrade also involved replacing many of the white LRSI tiles on the upper surfaces with advanced flexible reusable surface insulation, FRC, blankets, also known as fibrous insulation blankets, or FIBs, that had been used on Discovery in Atlantis. Originally, Columbia had 32,000 tiles. The upgrade reduced this to 24,300. The FRC blankets consisted of layers of pure silica felt sandwiched between a layer of silica fabric on the outside and S glass fabric on the inside, stitched together using pure silica thread in a 1 inch grid, then coated with a high purity silica coating. The blankets were semi rigid and could be made as large as 30 by 30 inches. Each blanket replaced as many as 25 tiles and was bonded directly to the orbiter. The direct application of the blankets to the orbiter resulted in weight reduction, improved durability, reduced fabrication and installation cost, and reduced installation schedule time. All of this work was performed during Columbia's first retrofitting on the post-Challenger stand-down. Despite refinements to the orbiter's thermal protection system and other enhancements, Columbia would never weigh as little unloaded as the other orbiters in the fleet. The next oldest shuttle, Challenger, was also relatively heavy although lighter than Columbia. Until its last refit, Columbia was the only operational orbiter with wing markings consisting of an American flag on the port, left, wing and the letters USA on the starboard right wing. Challenger, Discovery, Atlantis and Endeavour all, until 1998, bore markings consisting of the letters USA above an American flag on the left wing, and the pre-1998 NASA worm logo for the respective orbiter's name on the right wing. Enterprise, the test vehicle which was the prototype for Columbia, originally had the same wing markings as Columbia but with the letters USA on the right wing spaced closer together, Enterprise's markings were modified to match Challenger in 1983, the name of the orbiter was originally placed on the payload bay doors much like Enterprise but was placed on the crew cabin after the Challenger disaster so that the orbiter could be easily identified while in orbit. From its last refit to its destruction, Columbia bore markings identical to those of its operational sister orbiters, the NASA meatball logo on the left wing and the American flag of for the orbiter's name on the right, only Columbia's distinctive wing chines remained. These black areas on the upper surfaces of the shuttle's forward wing were added because, at first, shuttle designers did not know how re-entry heating would affect the craft's upper wing surfaces. The chines allowed Columbia to be easily recognized at a distance, as opposed to the subsequent orbiters. The chines were added after Columbia arrived at Ka Este in 1979. Another unique external feature, termed the Silts Pod, Shuttle Infrared Lee Side Temperature Sensing, was located on the top of Columbia's vertical stabilizer, and was installed after STS 9 to acquire infrared and other thermal data. 
Though the pod's equipment was removed after initial tests, NASA decided to leave it in place, mainly to save costs, along with the agency's plans to use it for future experiments. The vertical stabilizer was later modified to incorporate the drag chute first used in Endeavour in 1992. Columbia was also originally fitted with Lockheed built ejection seats identical to those found on the SR-71 Blackbird. These were active for the four orbital test flights, but deactivated after STS-4, and removed entirely after STS-9. Columbia was also the only spaceworthy orbiter not delivered with head-up displays for the commander on pilot, although these were incorporated after STS-9. Like its sister ships, Columbia was eventually retrofitted with a new MEDS glass cockpit display and lightweight seat. Had Columbia not been destroyed, it would have been fitted with the external airlock slash docking adapter for STS-118, an International Space Station assembly mission, originally planned for November 2003. Columbia was scheduled for this mission due to Discovery being out of service for its orbital maintenance down period, and because the ISS assembly schedule could not be adhered to with only Endeavour and Atlantis. Columbia's career would have started to wind down after STS-118. It was to serve as the Hubble Space Telescope two more times between 2004 and 2005, but no more missions were planned for it again except for a mission designated STS-144 where it would retrieve the Hubble Space Telescope from orbit and bring it back to Earth. Following the Columbia accident, NASA flew the STS-125 mission using Atlantis, combining the planned fourth and fifth servicing missions into one final mission to Hubble. Because of the retirement of the space shuttle fleet, the batteries and gyroscopes that keep the telescope pointed will eventually fail also because of the magnifier screen, which would result in its re-entry and breakup in Earth's atmosphere. A soft capture docking mechanism, based on the docking adapter that was to be used on the Orion spacecraft, was installed during the last servicing mission in anticipation of this event. Columbia was also scheduled to launch the X-38 V-201 crew return vehicle prototype as the next mission after STS-118 until the cancellation of the project in 2002. Columbia flew 28 missions, gathering 300.74 days spent in space with 4,808 orbits and a total distance of up until STS-107. Despite being in service during the Shuttle Mir and International Space Station programs, Columbia did not fly any missions that visited a space station. The other three active orbiters at the time had visited both Mir and the ISS at least once. Columbia was not suited for high inclination missions. No wiki less than slash no wiki mission cancelled following suspension of shuttle flights following the Challenger disaster. No wiki less than slash no wiki mission flown by Endeavour due to loss of Columbia on STS-107. No wiki less than slash no wiki mission flown by Discovery due to loss of Columbia on STS-107. Columbia was destroyed at about 9 o'clock EST on February 1, 2003 while re-entering the atmosphere after a 16-day scientific mission. The Columbia Accident Investigation Board determined that a hole was punctured in the leading edge on one of Columbia's wings, which was made of a carbon composite. The hole had formed when a piece of insulating foam from the external fuel tank peeled off during the launch 16 days earlier and struck the shuttle's left wing. During the intense heat of re-entry, hot gases penetrated the interior of the wing likely compromising the hydraulic system and leading to control failure of the control surfaces. The resulting loss of control exposed minimally protected areas of the orbiter to full entry heating and dynamic pressures that eventually led to vehicle breakup. The report delved deeply into the underlying organizational and cultural issues that the board believed contributed to the accident. The report was highly critical of NASA's decision-making and risk assessment processes. Further, the board determined that, unlike NASA's early claims, a rescue mission would have been possible using the shuttle Atlantis, which was essentially ready for launch, and might have saved the Columbia crew members. The nearly 84,000 pieces of collected debris of the vessel are stored in a 16th floor office suite in the Vehicle Assembly Building at the Kennedy Space Center. The collection was opened to the media once and has since been open only to researchers. Unlike Challenger, which had a replacement orbiter built, Columbia did not. The seven crew members who died aboard this final mission were Rick Husband, Commander, William C. McCool, Pilot, Michael P. Anderson, Payload Commander Slash Mission Specialist 3, David M. Brown, Mission Specialist 1, Kyle Panachawa, Mission Specialist 2, Laurel Clark, Mission Specialist 4, and Elon Ramon, Payload Specialist 1.
The debris field encompassed hundreds of miles across northeast Texas and into Louisiana. The nose cap and remains of all seven crew members were found in Sabine County, East Texas. To honor those who lost their lives aboard the shuttle and during the recovery efforts, the Patricia Huffman Smith NASA Museum Remembering Columbia was open Eden Hemp Hill, Sabine County, Texas. The museum tells the story of Space Shuttle Columbia explorations throughout all its missions, including the final STS-107. Its exhibits also show the efforts of local citizens during the recovery period of the Columbia shuttle debris and its crew's remains. An area is dedicated to each STS-107 crew member, and also to the Texas Forest Service helicopter pilot who died in the recovery effort. The museum houses many objects and artifacts from NASA and its contractors. The families of the STS-107 crew, and other individuals. The crew's families contributed personal items of the crew members to be on permanent display. The museum features two interactive simulator displays that emulate the activities of the shuttle and orbiter. The Digital Learning Center and its classroom provide educational opportunities for all ages. The Columbia Memorial Space Center is the U.S. National Memorial for the Space Shuttle Columbia S-7 crew members. It is located in Downey on the site of the Space Shuttle's origins and production, the former North American Aviation Plant in Los Angeles County, Southern California. The facility is also a hands-on learning center with interactive exhibits, workshops, and classes about space science, astronautics, and the Space Shuttle program's legacy, providing educational opportunities for all ages. The shuttle's final crew was honored in 2003 when the United States Board on Geographic Names approved the name Columbia Point for a mountain in Colorado's Sangre Cristo Mountains, less than a half mile from Challenger Point, a peak named after America's other lost space shuttle. The Columbia Hills on Mars were also named in honor of the crew, and a host of other memorials were dedicated in various forms. The Columbia Supercomputer at the NASA Advanced Supercomputing NAS, Division located at Ames Research Center in California was named in honor of the crew lost in the 2003 disaster. Built as a joint effort between NASA and technical partners SGI and Intel in 2004, the supercomputer was used in scientific research of space, the Earth's climate, and aerodynamic design of space launch vehicles and aircraft. The first part of the system, built in 2003, was dedicated to STS-107 astronaut and engineer Kalpana Chawla who prior to joining the Space Shuttle program worked at Ames Research Center. Guitarist Steve Morse of the rock band Deep Purple wrote the instrumental Contact Lost in response to the tragedy, recorded by Deep Purple and featured as the closing track on their 2003 album Bananas. It was dedicated to the astronauts whose lives were lost in the disaster. Morse donated songwriting royalties to the families of lost astronauts. Astronaut and mission specialist engineer Kalpan Achawla, one of the victims of the accident, was a fan of Deep Purple and had exchanged emails with the band during the flight, making the tragedy even more personal for the group. She took three CDs into space with her, two of which were Deep Purple albums, Machine Head and Perpendicular. Both CDs survived the destruction of the shuttle and the 39-mile plunge. The musical group Echoes Children included singer-songwriter Cat Faber's Columbia on their final album From the Hazel Tree. The Long Winters Band's 2005 album Ultimatum features the song The Commander Thinks Aloud, a tribute to the final Columbia crew. The Eric Johnson instrumental Columbia from his 2005 album Bloom was written as a commemoration and tribute to the lives that were lost. Johnson said I wanted to make it more of a positive message, a salute, a celebration rather than just concentrating on a few moments of tragedy, but instead the bigger picture of these brave people's lives. The graphic novel Orbiter by Warren Ellis and Colleen Duran was dedicated to the lives, memories and legacies of the seven astronauts lost on Space Shuttle Columbia during mission STS-107. Laurel Clark's wake-up call on STS-107 was Runrig's running to the light. Laurel took the Stamping Ground CD into space with her and when the shuttle exploded CD was found back on Earth, and presented to the band. Somewhere, the final track on the band's last studio album, The Story ends with a recording of her voice introducing the song. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.